Good evening. It's our joy to be together tonight on this Wednesday evening, this windy Wednesday evening. Uh, great to see you all here uh, to worship together and uh, have this time of devotional. Uh, we're thankful for our time together. Tell you a little bit about the, the class arrangement. It will be our typical setup with youth class in the youth room. Uh, we will also have our children's Bible hour going on right now as we speak, and the children will be joining us at the end of our service together. Uh, what is not typical is the month of April, uh, because that is our mission month, one of the two times, um, April and October, when we prepare to give toward our mission efforts uh, globally. Uh, we've kicked off our mission month last Wednesday and then this past Sunday with some mission presentations on uh, home mission, truth for today. Today we have one more of those mission presentations to, to share, and uh, it's coming from uh, a familiar face for you all, uh, because uh, Roger Medina, who uh, leads our Spanish-speaking service uh, just to my left over here, uh, is also involved in the work that we support in El Salvador and, and in Mexico and in Latin America uh, through World Bible Institute. So we're excited to hear what Roger's going to share. He's just gotten back from both of those places we mentioned, Mexico and El Salvador. So got some fresh stories for us um, and, and an update on the work that they're doing and that we're supporting. A uh, reminder that on the last Sunday of April, we'll be doing our first of two collections for Mission Month. Uh, so we uh, look forward to having that opportunity on April 28th. I have a couple of prayer updates to share with you, and, uh, and I, um, these are things that have come to me uh, since the last email was sent out yesterday. Um, so I want to make you aware of, of some of these things. So Pam Pickett's mother fell and broke her hip. Um, she has been in the hospital. Last I heard was still in the hospital. She lives up in the Lubbock area in Lubbock. Um, and so uh, please be remembering Sue Russworm. Uh, in your prayer, some of you may remember Sue Russworm from her time here, um, and so uh, remember Sue and remember the Pickett family um, after that fall recently. Continue to pray for Ken Brown um, as he's recovering from his first round of treatment and uh, and getting ready for more treatments to come. Um, I was also asked to share that Glenna Perkins is going to be having a heart valve replacement surgery a week from tomorrow. So that's April 18th is when that surgery is going to be taking place. And so please be remembering Glenna uh, and that upcoming surgery. Uh, we're, we're, we're continuing to remember Christine's mom, uh, who's been having health uh, complications. And she's been very weak um, in the aftermath of her procedure and having some issues that they've been running tests for her and trying to figure out what's causing her to be so weak. Well, they took her back to the hospital today. Uh, in order to do more tests. So please keep them, keep her in your prayers because that's something new today that she's back in the hospital again. And then one more thing from the Nations family and also um, Teresa Holiday. Uh, Teresa Holiday and Jerry Nations' great nephew, uh, Bryce uh, Winters, uh, had a back surgery at Cook Children's at the end of last week, and he's still in the hospital recovering from that. So uh, those are several new things that needed to be shared with you tonight, and we ask that you remember those all in your prayers, and we'll add them to the next announcement list as well for us to be praying about it. As we get ready to start our devotional, let's bow in prayer. Dear Lord, our God, we love you so much. We thank you for today. Pray that you would bless this time we spend together and bless those that we've just mentioned um, as, as those that are in need of your care. Continue to be with Ken Brown as he uh, recovers from his first round of treatment. Take care of him and give him strength. Pray that you be with Christine Nation's mother as she's continuing to undergo those difficulties with her health. And we pray that you bless her and take care of her and give the doctors wisdom about what's going on with her. Lord, please bless uh, Bryce Winters as he recovers from his surgery and, and give him a, a swift recovery and uh, although he's at a young stage in his life, Lord, we know this is a difficult thing to be going through, and Lord, we pray that you just take care of him and, and bless him. Lord, we ask that you be with the Perkins family, both Jerry and Glenna, and uh, take care of them and their health. And with Glenna having this procedure coming up next week, we pray that it would go smoothly and that it would uh, bring relief to her and that it would be uh, helpful for her moving forward and that everything would just go very well. Pray that you bless that. 
be with the others that are on our mind. We know there are many more that we care about and are thinking of. We continue to pray for Randall, Katie. Um, we continue to pray for Tony Sunday's father and his uh, upcoming surgery. Uh, Lord, please bless them and take care of them. And Lord, we thank you for the fact that you do hear our prayers and you are, are one who, who listens when we call to you. We thank you for that so much. We thank you for your work around the world, and, and we're excited to hear more about what's going on in Latin America tonight. Please bless the church and bless those uh, people that are working hard to make that ministry um, align with your will. And all these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I don't think we're going to have very many visual aids this evening. <laughs> Um, but uh, the first song I'm going to sing is Highest Place. It's not in the songbook, but I'm pretty sure y'all know it. And if you don't, just listen to me, uh, and I'll sing it for us. We place you on the highest place. Oh, you are the great high priest. We place you High above all else, all else, and we come to you and worship at your feet. We place you on the highest place. Number 682. Number 682. I'm sure most of y'all know this song without the song book also, but if you want to and if it's convenient, look it up. <clears throat> to God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Great things He hath taught us, great things He hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth... <coughs> praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. And give him the glory, great things he hath done. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for bringing us all here together tonight safely. God, we pray that we would... Remember just how glorious and mighty you are. Um, we've had so many opportunities to see your majesty on display this week already. 
And we just hope that we would help to point others to see that you love them and you care for them uh, and that you are, in fact, able to do all those things that we cannot do on our own. God, I pray that tonight as we uh, worship you, as we hear from Roger, and as we just think about what your word is and what it means for us and for all the people of this world, I pray that your spirit would fill us and that we would continue to strive to do your work in this place, both in our community here and in the world at large. God, we thank you so much for Jesus, for everything that he shows us about you, and for the way that he shows us we could live uh, if we would trust in you too. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading tonight is coming from Psalm 61, verses 1 through 4. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. The song before the lesson is number 968. But if you want to go ahead and mark the song of invitation, it'll be number 272. 272 for the song of invitation. I bet y'all hadn't done that in a while, mark the song of invitation. It's an old habit, so they don't go away, though. <clears throat> number 968. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free from the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine.
okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, technology is a great blessing when it works, right? <laughs> um, you know, it kind of reminds me, uh, we, when we travel and we go to do mission work, uh, you know, sometimes there is no technology. We're just out there in the field or out there walking, and, and they say, well, Roger, uh, can you teach a lesson? I say, well, thank you, yeah. I'll teach a lesson. I said, okay, well, you have the first hour. I'll take the second hour, and so-and-so will take the third hour. I was like, oh, okay, so it's an hour long, okay. <laughs> so it's interesting, and I, and I love that. I enjoy it. But there's times where I've gone, and they want, uh, you know, preach as long as you can. And I'm like, well, I'm pretty long-winded, but, uh, you know, after an hour and a half, it gets kind of... It gets overwhelming. It gets tiring. The brain starts malfunctioning. But we will keep it at 30 minutes. Now, it's kind of hard to talk about the mission work without any visual aids, right? It's kind of hard to kind of see and what's going on around the world, what we're doing, and how we're helping. And uh, technology, like I said, sometimes it's a blessing and sometimes it's a headache. And I know that sometimes, especially the men back there that are trying to make everything happen... They're trying to figure out, thinking 10 things at a time, trying to see how to fix the issue, and yet they can't fix it. Uh, but we'll do what we can. So I want to talk to you about World Bible Institute and the work that we do. The support that we get for the World Bible Institute from College Hill is for the Spanish-speaking uh, world. And so as a, a representative for the World Bible Institute, as a regional coordinator you know, we're looking always to reach out to different parts of the world. And right now we're having, uh, we have three schools that are active and are uh, highly involved in the work. And as uh, Stephen mentioned, I just got back from El Salvador. A week later, I came, uh, went to Mexico, just got back from there as well. And I was telling Brady in the office, you know, my body is telling me I'm getting old, but I don't feel old. I said, now I can't keep up because it's, we stay, we get up early in the morning, we go home late every day as we're on the mission field. And sometimes we eat as we go, but sometimes we're invited at homes to eat. So it's, it's, it's very, um, it's a very blessing to see how many are willing to, you know, support and help the cause. And it's, and it's very amazing. I wish I, you could have seen the images that I had for you and, and some of the videos that I had. It was too much. It really, we couldn't do it in half an hour. But I really want you to talk a little bit about the Institute of El Salvador. So in El Salvador, we have two schools now. We used to only have one uh, closer to Guatemala, but now we have one in the capital of San Salvador. But we're talking to that school to see if we could establish another one down south, close to Nicaragua, which would be uh, fully supported as well. Now, when we talk about fully support, I want you guys to see when we get to that school of what uh, the possibilities that we have and what we can work with. But talking about the one in Santa Ana, so that's uh, further to the coast. They're about um, 10, 15 minutes away, a congregation where they go to Guatemala, so the border. And um, so it's closer down that, uh, to that route, so you guys can have a, a visual. We have the map, we've got a scene. Uh, they have the ninth generation right now graduating. The, the fourth generation online, they started the online school back in 2020 before there was a pandemic. So in their mind, they wanted to start the online school. And when they kick-started in 2020, Soon after, they had the problems with the pandemic, which the school continued. And so it, it fell just right into where a lot of people can study online and be reached out to through the gospel and be educated, be taught. And, and you know, one of the things that we love about this is it costs no money to do this. Because everybody can have their cell phone or the computer and they're willing to be there. One of the things that we started running into was their phones in uh, Latin America. Uh, some of their phones will get hot, you know, by going live. And they get so hot that they shut off. 
or they have to turn them off because they're afraid they might explode. And a lot of the students were watching the videos or watching the classes live, and yet they had to come into that where after an hour they had to cut off because they couldn't continue. It wasn't that they didn't want to. It wasn't that they had other things to do. It was just that they couldn't stay on the phone. So that was an issue that was uh, resolved by getting them tablets and um, allowing the tablets to take on that load instead of the phone, which they're not made as in the best quality. And sometimes the batteries, like I said, they, they can explode and they have exploded. So that's one of the things that they run into. But they're always willing. They're willing to help. They're willing to serve. Uh, I had a picture of the building uh, where they congregate. They're not, it's not a really big building in Santana. It's a well-populated city, over half a million uh, in population. Um, a lot of congregations around, a lot of congregations around in the city, uh, around the other uh, counties, if we can say. They're called um, departments out there, but really they're counties, if you can understand the, the concept. And uh, uh, the congregations around there have gone, and they continue to go and learn to study. Some of, some of these students will travel four hours to go to school and study and stay Saturday all day because it's a Saturday school. We'll stay there for eight hours and then drive back home four hours. You know, and that's that's because that's a desire. Now, the the school in Santa Ana is we support them with three hundred dollars a month, which is thirty six hundred a year, and it doesn't matter how many students they have because it's on Saturday school. So because of that, uh, that when they meet, there are they can also offer them a meal on Saturday. You know, food so that they can eat in the morning or lunch or or maybe even dinner before they leave. And uh, it helps the students to understand that they can work Monday through Friday or Saturday and then go to school. Monday through Friday, sorry. And then Saturday go to school all day to learn more from the word. And we always encourage the men, either young men or, or middle-aged men. Any man that goes into the school, we always encourage them to preach. So we prepare them to teach lessons and we prepare them to send them out, do um, lectureships that the young men are leading or gospel meetings that the young men are leading or even preaching on Sundays or sometimes a congregation needs a speaker, they'll send one of the young men out there. Now, this is something that all the schools that we work with do because we are highly, highly um, motivated to continue to teach the young men to be the leaders that the church needs. And, and, you know, put in, in, in the Apostle Paul's word, in the, in the Spanish version, it says that men be manly. You know, that men be men, in other words. And so we got to lead. We got we to gotta remember that we're always in that, in that phase. We're always the leaders. No matter what, people depend on us, and we need to re be reminded of that. And so we, we teach the young men to do this. And, they and I was going to show you some pictures so you can see uh, some of these young men are in their early 20s, I would say, maybe mid-20s. And some uh, uh, men my age uh, as well that are going through the school. And so they're always encouraged to teach. They just had a graduation uh, last December. They graduated 30 students, and they're coming along again with more students uh, they have the online school as well, and the online school uh, is doing great. I would say it's doing uh, very um, abundantly, as we can say. It's the word that escapes my, my mind right now, but it, it's being so successful because you have to understand this school is you enroll, and there's nothing you pay. Everything's free, but you have to be dedicated. So if Monday they have a class, you have to be online on Monday. You can't have the camera turn off. Maybe you are teachers. Some of you guys are here, or retired teachers. Maybe if you guys had a teaching class during the pandemic, and they would go online and they would shut off their camera, right, because they don't want to be seen. <laughs> they don't do that on the online school, you know, because they're, they're taught. And one of the things says, hey, we want to know that you are 
you know, that you are there and that you, you're this, this is the class to educate, to encourage and to teach you. And so we want to know that everybody's learning. They'll pick random uh, students, ask questions, and um, everybody's focused on the class. And so one of the things is that they have in this class is they have students from Guatemala, from there, El Salvador. They even have students from the United States, which caught my attention. I was like, wow, I guess we need to continue to, you know, promote school online because we do have one. I'll talk about that here in a bit. They have students from Honduras and Nicaragua. So they do have a few students that are coming alongside into the online school because they want to learn. But not a lot of them can go apply for a visa and come to a school in the United States or apply for a visa and go to the schools in Mexico because they live in other countries and they just can't afford that. It's a lot of money, a lot of paperwork, and, and a lot of stress sometimes. So... What World Bible Institute has done and the mindset that we have is we're trying to bring the teaching to them wherever they're at in their own lifestyle. So if they're working Monday through Friday, we want to be able to teach them on Saturday. And, and we, we look for places that have that vision, that the, the preachers and teachers will have that encouragement. Now, one of the things that I want you to understand as well is all these teachers, they do it out of... Love for God's cause. All these schools are supported because they're only supported to support the school and the needs of the school. Sometimes there's that one-time needs or, or one-time benevolence that can be done, but really our focus is the school. And so that's one of the things that we always uh, stay in touch. We always encourage them, and they give us a report every two months. They'll send a report, which... I will send to the missions committee as well. And I do present that to the missions committee when I have the opportunity. Um, but, you know, learning from Santa Ana, which is uh, IBIS or Biblical Institute of El Salvador, is a great place to go. If you haven't gone to El Salvador right now, is the safest nation in the world. When back then, it was the worst, unsafest nation in the world. There is so many tourists going in and so many uh, um, religion going into San, uh, El Salvador that the church needs to continue to be taught so that they can continue to grow. But I would feel safe to take my family. I know Spencer has felt safe to take his family. And I know you would feel safe to go. I mean, there's, there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, and really, uh, when we go, we have gone and, and been everywhere. And even in places where they said back then, you couldn't drive down the streets. And now the Uber uh, driver will go down the streets. Because even their life was at risk. They wouldn't go in there. But it's interesting to see all these changes. Now, moving from El Salvador to, uh, to from Santana, sorry, to San Salvador... We have the School of Preaching of El Salvador. Now, this is the one we just started working with. And Brother Miguel Arguera has two brothers here in the United States. They're both preachers. One of them is in Houston. The other was in Tennessee. The one in Tennessee, Brother Rigoberto, him, him and his wife have cancer. His is terminal now. And his vision, his mindset is still to provide to help the church. And it's interesting to find these kind of stories to see that Brother Miguel has the same vision. If The time that we have known him, the time that we spend with him at his home, you can tell that the vision's understood of we're just passing through. We're just passing through. And so Brother Rigoberto, when I uh, met him, uh, and I found out about his cancer situation, you could talk to him and you wouldn't tell. He would not tell you that he's in a situation like that. His wife is in the same condition, and yet they still are active and working and doing. And his other brother, Rudy, he's in Houston, and he's very also active with the, with the school. Him, Miguel and his brother were the ones, Rudy, supporting this school since it started back in 1993. 
I just found out recently because one of the guys I work with teaches school there. And he says, brother, do you know about this school? I said, no. He goes, you should go look at this school. And I said, well, you know, let's make a, a meeting. Let's arrange it and let's go. And when I was there, it got me impressed to see how all the ages in the church, the young kids all the way to um, elderlies, they're all active. They're all working. They're all doing something. And it's encouraging to see that even though the, the uh, building, when they built back in the day, the Catholic church built right next door to them, okay? And I mean literally, the wall there on the other side would be the Catholic church. And it wasn't there, but they decided to build next to it. And one of the things that we have is uh, they, they have so much love and, and uh, for the souls that they'll talk to anyone in love. That's one of the things that, that caught my attention. I had the opportunity to go, and, and when I first, uh, the second time I went, um, like I said, we were there, we got there and said, Brother Roger, can you teach Bible class tonight? It was on a Tuesday. I said, yes, I'll teach Bible class. There was an earthquake that uh, back then. I remember if I shared this with you and the floor started shaking. Now I'm from California, so I figured, hey, man, this ain't, this is not something just, you know, that's happening. This is an earthquake. Floor starts shaking and we don't, they don't have pews, they have chairs. So some of the members started kind of rocking and kind of moving. And I just started to calm them down and said, hey, brother, it's okay. We're in the right place. If anything happens, we're right with the Lord. So let's just continue. Well, we could hear our neighbors uh, in, in, in the music that they had. Soon after, we didn't hear them. Once we finished the class and, you know, we were done, we went outside and we started talking and said, hey, we're going to go visit this family that has allowed us to go teach to them. Uh, it's an apostolic church. I said, Brother Roger, would you teach class? I said, yeah, I'll teach class. How long do I have? He said, Roger, you could do an hour. I'll do the next hour. I said, okay. And so we went out there. Right after that, we went to the church and taught. And the brother made sure that they said, hey, you allowed us to come and teach Bible to you. And so we're here and we're, we wanted to see if that was a possibility for us to teach Bible to you. They said, yes, that's why we invited you. They fed us all pupusas. There was about 50 of us. And, uh, and we were there. We were learning. And they wanted, they, they do something of all night kind of thing. So they were wanting all night. And I said, I got a flight like at 10. <laughs> I got to leave here probably in a bit so I could do the first lesson. But that's, that's as much as I can stay. And uh, as soon as we stayed there, brother said, hey, we're cutting it short, man. We got to go now. And so we went, drop off at the airport. As soon as I walked in, went straight to the gate and straight to the plane because that was that short of a time. And all that, all day... We were walking and teaching and preaching, and, and I was exhausted. I fell asleep in the plane. I, 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 it was from midnight till 5 in the morning that we were going to arrive here, and it was so exhausting. It was tiring. And I, it was something thinking of, this is the kind of work I want to be involved with. I want to be involved where I'm, I'm tired because I felt that I'm being useful. And that's just my mindset, but that's how I feel. I, I want to be I want to feel useful that I did something. I accomplished something today. And so with the brethren, it was something that really encouraged me. Well, talking to Brother Miguel, uh, they have land that uh, they own back in 1996. I think he bought that land. And uh, they have around 60 acres. Now, 30 of those acres, I would have pictures for you here. 30 of those acres are coffee field. And so what we're trying to do is encourage him and help him in a way to turn those 30 into 60. And that's going to take money. It's going to take time. It's going to take help. Now, uh, we broke it down to the uh, minutia of, of details, if we can say. The plants are 35 cents. So 
every plant that can be planted is 35 cents. And so that can be put down in this 30 acres and can grow even more to produce the money or the funds. Now, they also uh, have honey. So they have a lot of beehives there. I think when we were there, they had a, a, a barrel of honey and they bottled it all up. And it was like 150 bottles of uh, a liter and a half bottles. And he's all, brother, you want to take some? I said, no, they won't allow me in the plane. They'll throw it away. I said, but I would have loved it. I know my wife would have loved it to be able to bring that honey, I said. But we did bring coffee. And now in the coffee, uh, they have about eight different coffee beans. And some of it is Costa Rica. Some of it is, it's just the name of it uh, or the, the, the bean as it called. Um, and I would have pictures for you here. Some of them are red, some are dark purplish, some are yellow, some are round, some are oval. But Miguel, he's, that's his education is in agriculture, so he knows all about the coffee beans. And they're trying to grow even more. They have, I think, an acre of, of bananas. And so our, our mindset and his mindset as well is, I bought this land for the church. I bought this so the school can thrive. And we said, well, let us help you make that a possibility. We're going to help you so that here on this time, as we will help support, as we will help raise, by a certain amount of years, you're going to be able to not only provide for this school, but for another school that, Lord willing, that can be established as well. Now, we did that kind of um, mentality as well with the brothers in India. In, in uh, Camerol, they have a school in Petur, they have another one. And uh, Brother Brandon Ferguson is the coordinator for those schools, but they're opening five more. And the brethren there, they bought land, and they asked him, Brother, what is the most thing that, you know, that can produce money, can produce funds? What, what can it be? He said, rice. But not any kind of rice, this type of rice. He said, okay, let me get some funds, and we'll help you buy rice. They went out of their own, because uh, Brother Jeremiah has a son who, who is a doctor and supports the father and his brother to be preachers and teachers. And so they went and bought the rice and started working the land and already putting the rice down before Brandon can do anything to even gather. So we ended up having different contacts. And here's another thing, uh, Brother Mark or, or the elders or anyone. Uh, there's a brother who dedicates to put wells in different places, different countries. And uh, he's always open to, to do this, to go put a well somewhere. So if, if you guys have a, a place, you know, just get a hold of me and we can reach out to the brother and, and then you guys can talk. And uh, what they do is just that. They just go put a, a well so that they can have water. Uh, so have that in mind. That's another thing that we love about it is we end up meeting great brethren like that, you know, that are encouraged to help and support and do whatever they can, even if it's just on their hands that they're working. Um, we went to the school. I just got back from Mexico, actually. Let me just talk a little bit about that because I know my time's running out. But I want to I talk to you, just kind of give you a glimpse of the school since we can't see them. I, I'm, I'm trying to, to let you see what I saw or at least feel the experience that I have felt uh, to understand the work that's being done. And so in Mexico, uh, the congregation there as well, it, it, the school that's in there, it's so active, um, and I'm always encouraged telling the brethren, whoever wants to come with me, come with me. I want you to see firsthand. I want you to experience what the brethren are doing. I want you to see the work that's being done so that you can see that what we're saying is what's really coming through. You know, and then that's one of the things that we're always encourage anyone to come to any of the schools who will want to come to be able to do so. Uh, the one in, in Matamoros, just on the other side of the of the border, uh, they have a school, but they they come together Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, and this is like at 7 p.m. Some of the brethren come straight from work, straight to the school, okay, and study for two hours, 
And then the school provides them a meal so that they can go home after they had dinner. And that's Monday, that's uh, Tuesdays, and that's Thursdays. And it, it, I was very encouraged as I was out there um, just a few week, uh, days ago to see that they had a lectureship that I was able to speak at that is involving all the congregations. There are about 25 congregations in Matamoros, and they're very united. So they do a lectureship, and they're also expecting a lot of people. So these lectureships every day is anywhere from 400 to 700. And you're talking about food. You got to feed this amount of people. You're talking about children. You're talking about teens. And you're talking about adults and seniors. And in that uh, crowd, they also have brethren who are uh, in the medical field. We had a doctor and about three nurses on staff just in case anything happened. There were some who felt dizzy, some who felt uh, maybe out of place, or maybe their sugar levels were skyrocketing, and so they had the doctors there um, to kind of attend them and see them if they needed anything. I think we had a, ended up getting insulin for one of the uh, members there who their sugar was so high. Uh, but the doctor there, the sister was, you know, taking care of him. And, and so one of the things is, you know, you, you, you get all these different things that you're not expecting to get. You know, like medical issues sometimes. And even in a lectureship, you're not expecting that, but it does happen. Here in the United States, you can call uh, 911. They'll send an ambulance. Not in Mexico. <laughs> you have to actually take them there. And then it's a long line or, you know. So just to give you guys a, a glimpse of what sometimes could happen outside of the United States. And so uh, at this lectureship, being this crowd is so big uh, inside and outside of the building and just in in a sense or in a way that you would be just amazed and shocked. I sent my daughters a video of the teens. All the youth got together to did a circle. And there's a school. I was talking to Brady about this. There's a school of um, song director in Mexico. And it's only one time a year. And I think it's only one week. But in that week, when you go from beginning to end, all they're teaching you is how to song lead, how to read the song, how to understand, how to teach the audience where you're going to start off, where you're going to end, and how to encourage the audience on where to hold the note and where to stop. And that's a lot of the things that here in the Spanish we don't have. Uh, We do have a lot of good song leaders in English, but sometimes we still need to just be more of you know, when we stop and when we don't. And, and that was encouraging. I also had the privilege to see Sonia Perez uh, come to the obedience of the gospel. After after her servant preached, uh, she came forward and she wanted to be baptized. And again, I said, you're talking about this room full. She comes forward and asks. And uh, they always ask the preacher who's just taught the lesson to take the confession and they always have a brethren or a preacher there that can perform the baptism. And so I took her confession, and then they, uh, they, um, uh, the brother uh, Villalobos uh, took care of her in the baptism. And, uh, you know, it was, it was always encouraging and uplifting to see. Uh, we gave her a Bible, had some Bibles to give away, so we gave her a Bible and had some books we gave away. We gave a bunch of books out there to the brethren. And it was encouraging, you know, to to understand uh, the message of the Lord. And so I want to finish up saying this. You know, when you read Acts chapter 8, it always comes to my attention, Philip and the eunuch. It always comes to my attention when God calls Philip and says, hey, you know, get close to that chariot. You You need to be where you need to be. You know, Philip could have already said, well, you know, Lord, he's probably already reading out loud Isaiah. He probably thought, hey, he's already reading. You know, when you read the account on Acts chapter 8, you find verse 26 and on that the eunuch had, he was on his way to Gaza from Jerusalem. He was coming back from worship. In his mind, in his heart, in his conscience, he, he thought he was right with God. But it wasn't until Philip gets close to him. And, and one of the things that he challenged them is, do you understand what you're reading? You know, a lot of people, 
that we encounter overseas or even here, when we ask the question, do you understand? Some people will be offended by that. I'm not saying that you don't have the comprehension to understand what you're reading. What we're saying is, do you really understand what you're reading? Is it, is, is, is it coming through? You know, a lot of people have an aspect of God, uh, an image. Probably mama and papa or, or mom and dad already taught us something about God. And so we figured this is how God should be. You know, we do this a lot in, in other aspects of, of our life. We do this in marriage. We see our parents and we think, oh, that's what marriage should be. No, no. You know, when you look at the Bible, then you understand what marriage should be. It's different from what you see to what God tells you. Most of the time, most of the time, you'll find people who have a concept of God, and yet when you read the scriptures to them, it's different. And it was different for the eunuch. You see, and Philip had to start preaching Jesus to him. And at one point or another, he told him the importance about baptism. And we know this because it's the eunuch who says, what forbids for me to be baptized? What hinders me? Is there anything else that I need to know? Is there anything that it forbids me from not doing it? Well, the confession, understanding, accepting the deity of Jesus. Brent, that's the, the, the great, uh, the, uh, I guess, problem for many is to understand the deity of Jesus. He's the Son of God. To understand and proclaim that and to accept that, it's to accept his authority. It's to accept what he says I must do. See, Jesus says in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Well, is he my Lord if I'm going to rebel against him? Then he's not my Lord. He said it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not all who call me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those that do the will of my Father will enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, it's about action. See, faith is not just only acknowledging his existence. Uh, James talks about this. James 2, verse 19. He talks about that even the devil uh, or the, the demons know and tremble. Yet, they're still devils. That's what he's really saying. You understand that God is one? Great. That's good. But that's not enough. You see, it's not enough to, to see or to understand God's existence. <clears throat> There's obedience to his word. That's acceptance. That's understanding Jesus is Lord. And I surrender to his authority. So what he asked me to do, I will do. Where he asked me to go, I will go. And when he asked me to say, I would say. You know, you look at Acts chapter 4, when the apostles and disciples pray and said, Lord, help us that we may speak boldly of your things. And then the Lord tells the Apostle Paul later on in Acts chapter 20, he says, be brave. I am with you. Speak. Do not withhold. You know, brethren, the Lord tells us over and over again, heaven is a place prepared for you and I. The question that lies is, do we believe it? And if we do, what are we doing? And if what we're doing is not according to God's will, will we still make it there? You would know that answer to your own life. I can only answer that question on my life. But you could answer your question for your life. God expects more if more is given to you. Or even that that you have will be taken away. So think about, as you go out today, how you live your life. Do you want to make a change today? It's up to you. It's always going to be in your hands. It's always going to be your responsibility. It's always going to be you who determines whether you have faith or not. No one can push you. We can only persuade. But you have to make the decision. Maybe... You're among us and you need prayer. Maybe you need encouragement. 
Maybe sometimes, brethren, we need to wake up. And somebody needs to wake us up. And if you feel that you need a prayer, let us know. We will pray for you. We want to be able to help you. You know, when you look at the government and you look at the Marines and the mentality of the government, no man left behind. That should be the mindset of the church. No one should stay behind in our mindset away from the Lord. We need to restore those that have fallen. And we need to bring those that do not know God to be able to come to know God so that they can also rejoice as we rejoice. Brethren, if you will be with me, if you can stand as we sing this song, I will always want to encourage you. If you feel the need to obey the gospel, we're here to help you. Here's water. And believe me, nothing should forbid you for doing it when there is faith. I've been in places where the water is freezing. I've been in places where the water is hot. I've seen places where there is animals that can take your life in the water. And yet they still go. Nothing forbids them. Nothing forbids you. This water is warm. It's nice. But you need to have faith. So we're going to sing a song of invitation. If you please stand with me as we sing. to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. I still will follow, no turning back, no turning back, my cross I'll carry till I see Jesus, the cross I'll carry till I see Jesus, my cross I'll carry till I see Jesus, no turning back, I'll follow All right, number 36. Number 36. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Save a wretch like me. I was, was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught. Stay. 
as Charlie gets her shoes back on, we will uh, talk about the lesson we learned. We talked the end of the story of Esther, uh, where uh, Haman gets his due uh, uh, results from uh, trying to build a gallows for Mordecai. So uh, anyway, uh, King Xerxes kind of sees it uh, Esther's way. And so we, our lesson was really on uh, worshiping God. We talked about uh, differences in Old Testament worship and how we are asked to worship God today. And uh, so we're going to sing a couple songs. We're going to sing uh, Joy, Joy, Joy. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart, down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart, down in my heart, and I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. I've got the wonderful love of my blessed Redeemer way down in the depths of my heart. Down in the depths of my heart. Down in the depths of my heart. I've got the wonderful love of my blessed Redeemer way down in the depths of my heart. Down the depths of my heart to stay, and I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart, down in my heart, and I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. All right, stand up. If the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on a tie. Ow! Sit on attack. Ow! Sit on attack. And if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on attack. Ow! Sit on attack to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart, down in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. And we're going to sing the crayon song, right? When I was a little child, no higher than your knee, my mother bought a box of crayons just for me. I picked them up, I looked, I looked way down inside. The colors there reminded me of Jesus when he died. Oh, red is the color of the blood that he shed. Brown is for the crown of thorns they placed upon his head. Oh, blue is for royalty in which he did not dwell. Yellow's for the Christian who's afraid to tell. I colored and I colored till my crayons were all gone and grew and grew and grew and grew and, grew and still I lingered on. So when I see a little child with crayon box in hand, I'll tell him what it means to me and hope they understand. Oh, red is the color of the blood that he shed. Brown is for the crown of thorns they placed upon his head. Oh, blue is for royalty in which he did not dwell. Yellow's for the Christian who's afraid to tell. So don't you be a Christian who's afraid to tell. All right, let's pray to God. Lord, we thank you so much for the story of Esther, for her uh, account in, in, your, in your Bible, and uh, that you have let us know what she did for you and her people and your people, uh, that she stood up for uh, what was right, and uh, that King Xerxes uh, listened to her. Help us to stand up for what is right. Help us to worship you in ways that you have asked us to and to worship ways that bring you glory. Help us to uh, invite others to worship you as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.